Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, well, since you mentioned I'm from Spain, from Bilbao, I have to say first it's a bit insensitive to have a Spaniard talking immediately after lunch, because uh, this is normally our siesta time. So um, what I will try and do is I'll keep an eye on the audience to see that everybody is awake. Um, and I'll try to keep you awake for the next 20 minutes. And yes, a lot of great talks this morning talking about measurement. Um, but I'd like to talk in the next 20 minutes really about an output, and the output being brands, and the output being brand building. Because it is true there are tons of opportunities, and the new ecosystem is showing us a lot of chances to engage with consumers better. But from the discussions this morning, we also say that there are a lot of challenges. And um, actually, in, in a bit of a black moment, the title that I had for this presentation was is brand building advertising dying? And I know it sounds a bit too drastic and pessimistic. And because I'm a sociologist, the first thing I do is talk to the people that feed us every day, which are consumers. So we did uh, a piece of quick research in Australia with some consumers, and we actually asked them some questions about advertising and how they feel about it. And the first thing that we ask them is, do you think there is more advertising today than three years back? And 80% of Australians feel that that is the case. And interestingly enough, seven out of 10 feel that that advertising is more annoying and more intrusive than it was three years ago. Now, this is a bit cheeky, and I'm sure there are quite a few researchers in the room, and they probably think, well, if you had asked the same question to Australians that are by nature quite cynical 10 years ago as well, we'll probably have had similar results, and that's probably true. What is different today, though, is that are acting on it. So this is a piece of work that we do called Ad Reaction across the globe, and one of the questions that we ask to people is whether they are actually in, in um, installing blockers either on their mobiles or on their desktops. And 36% of Australians between 16 and 19 year old have an ad block either on their phones or on their desktop. Let me tell you one thing though about that figure. This is not life cycle. So it's not like when somebody reaches 25, it's going to go, well, from now on, I'm absolutely fine for brands talking to me, and I'm going to disinstall my ad blocker. This is here to stay. So, and we heard from a presentation before, it's growing year on year at 30%. So what happens if 50% of the audience today between 16 and 19 are used to simply block advertising? A lot of the discussions we've had today will take a different, a different um, stage, but it must be serious enough when um, in a very Marvel movie type of title, there's a group of people that have decided to create a coalition for good advertising. It really sounds like a bunch of superheroes to me. And I don't know how many of you have heard about this. I mean, the IAB in Australia is also participating on this, but they are not a small superheroes. So we have the two biggest, or what you could argue, the two biggest media owners in the world in this coalition. You have the two biggest media agencies in the world in that coalition, and two of the five biggest advertisers in the world in that coalition. And what they discuss and what they are trying to do and set up as practices is how can we ensure that we do advertising as an industry that respects the consumers? So what I will go through now is really talking about what are the things that lead to better brand building through advertising and, and the things that we need to watch out for. And I'm gonna just talk about four things. And, you know, we love data, so the first thing is about data and how we use data to actually reach consumers and target consumers. Somebody was talking about human, humanizing um, um, the consumer and the audience. And this is not a cynical presentation about digital. Let me make that very, very clear. I know there is a professor here in Australia that is world famous for his position about digital and the digital industry. I'm not that. I firmly believe the programmatic is the future. Somebody was talking this morning about addressable TV. So everything will become digital. But it is true that today we focus so much on the vision of the future and the path that we need to follow to develop and deploy that, that, that vision is quite difficult. And that's where measurement needs to play a very, very important role. So again, I went back to consumers. This is a sentence I've even heard today. 
you know, the power of advertising is we can reach these days the right person at the right time with the right message. I don't think anybody will have win a pitch in media in the last five years if they hadn't used that as part of their pitch. And in a market like Australia, where more than 50 cents of every dollar is spent on digital, if this is true, it should feel true to the consumer. So we went and spoke to them. And we asked them a simple question. How many times in the last week do you remember seeing an ad online that was selling you something at the right time? One in 10 say they, they do remember that. But actually, of those that remember advertising, seven out of 10 said they actually remember in the last week seeing advertising that was totally irrelevant to them. Now, that's the quantitative experience. I started my career as a qualitative researcher, so here comes a qualitative experience, and this is more about me. Um, again, this is the last time I'm gonna say I'm a Spanish, but I'm a Spanish. If I'm proud of something, is we know how to party better than anybody else. <laughs> or, or that is what I thought until I went to Hong Kong Sevens last year. <laughs> and uh, it might have been the, the age in which I went to Hong Kong Sevens, um, but it was difficult to keep up with the, with, the, with the party there. And I'm sure many of you know Hong Kong Sevens, but you know, one of the key things is the three days of party and you need to dress up. And just to prove that I was there, <laughs> I was actually dressed up in a properly cropped picture. I was dressed up in Hong Kong as a Navy captain. The reason why I'm telling you this story is because I bought that online. And I guarantee you, this happened last year. This didn't happen five years ago. For seven months, I was receiving impressions about me buying all kind of colors, shorts, some of them more kinky than others, captain suits, <laughs> captain suits, where I had already made my purchase. I was not going to buy another one. We talk a lot about the moment, and we talk a lot about the context, and when we, we, we um, are reaching consumers. And this is um, and a story about Uber that has happened to me as well, um, where I like playing um, a lot of my, on my phone games, and sometimes I need rewards to be able to get an extra life. So I'm one of those that actually is very happy with the mobile reward advertising, because I watch a video and I get an extra life. And it's great when I do that, and consistently I'm getting a lot of Uber apps for me to download, and Uber, the Uber app. And interestingly enough, that is happening while I'm inside an Uber, and while I've had an Uber app in my phone for the last two and a half years. So is this really surprising what is happening? This is real data now. Um, so this is not asking consumers. This is looking at what's being served. So Commerce Score in Asia tell us that five out of 10 impressions are served outside the target audience. So with all the algorithms, with all the data that we have, which, let me remind you, is really the future, but at the moment it's like throwing a coin. It's five out of 10. And it's interesting that in, from the same data here, the bigger the number, the worse the news. What we have is that, you know, if we go to consumer goods and CPGs, and let's face it, how much data do we have about household cleaners? I mean, you have to have a pretty sad life to have a fingerprint of your digital life full of household cleaners data. So when it comes to CPG, seven out of 10 are served outside the target audience. And when it comes to more specific age groups and demographics, so if we are saying 15 to 24 years old, that's what I'm trying to reach. Again, seven out of 10 are served outside the target audience. So what does this mean in terms of measurement? What it means is, you, doesn't mean you shouldn't do programmatic. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be using data to target your consumers. What it means, very simply, is you should measure. You should actually understand and do an audience validation or who have you served your advertising to. So we talk about a lot of fancier stuff, but you know, this is pretty, pretty basic. Um, who have I spoken to? And Sarah said an example of a campaign we measure here in Australia that explains this very well. This is a very recent, it was, it was really literally done last month, but this is a brand that is, the target is mums with kids zero to 19. Well, we can talk about brand lift as much as we can and as much as we want and what is the impact on the brand, but the reality is if 
76% of your impressions are served outside that target. And over half of them are served to actually empty nesters. That's a pretty extreme polarization of your target audience. So um, that's the first thing, how, how can measure and measurement help? But the second thing, which is more in the, what I call is still a little bit hallucination area, but it is, it is happening more and more, is how am I actually using survey data to enrich the data that I use for targeting and for reaching my consumers? Because there are certain things you are not gonna know unless you ask. So let me show you an example. This is some work we did with, with uh, Kantar TNS. Um, and basically what we did is we segmented the audience, we humanized the audience. We segmented the audience in three simple groups for Holiday Inn. We said, who are the super lovers of Holiday Inn? Who are those that no matter how great advertising you have, they're never gonna put a foot into a Holiday Inn? And who are those that are not users, but are open to, to, to become customers of Holiday Inn? And then all we did is use those to see the DMP and to actually build lookalike models that help us to, particularly on the second group, those that are more willing to go but they are not regular users, to actually scale that to a pool of about 25 million unique, unique cookies. And the buy-in was done based on that, or part of the buy-in was done based on that exercise. The results in terms of measurement and brand lift were really strong, so that was 38% in, in brand consideration, which was nearly double to any other um, audience segment used for the buying. And most importantly, Holiday Inn, so five times an increase in, in bookings in their site compared to the same period the previous year. So again, when we talk about measurement, I don't know how many of you here are clients and I don't know how many of you have tracking, but some of the things that we need to start talking more about that is how do we integrate data that we are constantly uh, getting from consumers and integrate that data into bigger data in which you are making, making targeting decisions. So that's the first thing. So the first thing is a lot about really understanding the audience and understanding who you are serving to. The second thing that drives better brand building outcomes is really being brave. And by being brave, I mean, you know, what digital has offered us, and somebody was talking today about the opportunity to really target somebody that is about to buy something in a category. And in some categories like cars, it might make a lot of sense. In some other categories, it doesn't make so much sense. But how do we balance that short-term need to deliver results with a longer-term need for brands? And this is happening, there's clearly a trend towards optimism, and I'll show you some data that proves that, but it's really happened for a few reasons. It's true that growth is, is harder to come by, and therefore there's a lot of pressure for results. It is also true that the average life of CMO, even in Australia, is declining, so there's less time to prove those results. In the UK, by the way, they beat you by a long shot. The average life of CMO is 18 months in the UK, not even two years. There is also a bit of a simplistic understanding of how brands grow. And this idea that if I muscle up, if I spend a lot of money and I sound louder than everybody else, that's all I really need to do. It doesn't really matter with what I said makes sense or it doesn't really make sense. It's all about being there. And finally, there is a lot about metrics. And it's funny, and BJ was mentioning about my article, that sometimes metrics have taken more power than outcomes. And digital metrics are driving optimism into it to a certain extent. And I'm gonna focus on that a little bit more because don't get me wrong, a lot of these metrics can make a lot of sense. So again, if I'm Uber and my metric is app installs, that makes the hell of a lot of sense to me. If I'm a growing up milk brand and I want to drive moms to my website so that they can get more information about what I'm doing and engage with them better, website visitations make the hell of a lot of sense. Now the challenge is that if we are measuring our performance based on these type of metrics, then what type of advertising are we gonna be creating? Certainly it's not gonna be brand building advertising. It's gonna be advertising that is going to provoke an immediate reaction. And we know how frequency is important in the world of media, not only message. So I'll be showing you something that you've seen already quite a bit. But, and, and when it comes to that measurement, I love that statement that it was not by me, it was by Einstein, so it's actually um, pretty robust. But 
not everything that can be measured counts, and not everything that counts can be measured. And what I mean with that is we've seen, and you've seen this in different formats throughout the day, and maybe you'll see it once more before the end, the, the end of the day. But you know, we have click-throughs, a massive optimization metric that we use across the board that means absolutely nothing. And when it actually means absolutely nothing and we optimize based on that, there is a risk. I mean, we've seen this morning, it has no correlation with sales, but it has zero, and that is zero, by the way, correlation with brand metrics, click-throughs. Now, what we do believe, and sometimes when we present that, clients look at us a bit astonished and say, so then what do I do? What do I measure? We do believe that actually brands are a great proxy for sales. We know that brands that are strong, and this is data correlating to actual sales, so it's not um, um, anything else but that. We see that brands with what we call a strong power, i.e. a strong brands drive more than double the volume than those that don't. And most importantly, they drive a price premium that weaker brands cannot drive. So if you understand as a measurement KPI how your brand is evolving in terms of impact, that has to be a phenomenal proxy for sales, not only short-term, but long-term sales as well. And also because in all honesty, short-term strategies do not always pay off. Uh, well, for the 18-month CMO, it probably does, but in general for the brands and the business, don't always pay off. This is not our work. This is done by IPA. Um, in, in the UK, the Institute of Practitioners of Advertisers. Um, and what they do is they do a big um, efficiency awards every year. And everybody that, that, what they did is they looked at all those campaigns that were presented and how many of those had in 2011 a short term way of demonstrating the impact of the campaign. And it was around 10%. Now, it was about 30%. And interestingly enough, those awarded now, 45% of those awarded had a short-term objective within the campaign, which, you know, what it means is the jury really favored those that could demonstrate the impact immediately. But then they did something more clever than that. What they did was they took those awarded and compared the absolute ROI dollar for the brand and the business compared to those not awarded. And look at the difference. And what happened now is that those campaigns that were awarded were six times more efficient than the not awarded, which means the jury did a good job. They did choose those that had won. But in 2011, those were 12 times more efficient. Because many times in measurement, we need to take into account things, remember what Einstein said, that we cannot always measure, but are more long term. So we run the brand C, which is um, 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 a big brand survey we do every year since 26. And we basically segment it into three groups. Those that are people that are telling us that brand purpose, brands have a purpose beyond just selling their product to brands that didn't respond that strongly on that. And as you can see, the growth of that, those brands over 10 years, those with a purpose have grown three times faster than those that don't have such a big purpose for consumers. I'm going to jump that because I'm a little bit um, worried about time. The last, the, the last two things, the first one I'll go very quickly is we've talked a lot about control. So if you want to bring, build brands, you need to give control to the consumer more today than ever. And I'm going to go super quickly on this. I'm just going to talk about formats. So again, we ask Australians, and you have the total population and the generation set, the 16 to 19 years old, how do they feel about advertising formats? <coughs> TV ads, which is your benchmark, most of the population, 39% say they feel they have a positive reaction towards them. By the way, when I said before, Australians are quite cynical. The average in the world is around 50%, so clearly lower in Australia. But as you can see online, either display or video ads is a lot lower than 22. Now, that can be improved. And that 22 goes to about a 41 or a 39, which is equitable to TV, once we use formats that give control to the user. But we can equally make it a hell of a lot worse 
And if, when we use formats that actually take away control from the user, that actually 22 can go down to a 16%, as you can see for mobile app pop-up, or 18%. And actually, actively, 44% of Australians telling us that they are actually really pissed off with that. So again, if you are brand building and you are using formats that are annoying people, what do you think that's gonna to do to your brand? I personally have to stop using brands because they force me once and once and once again to watch their ads online. So if we can force people, then what is the winner? How do we get them engaged? How do we bring, uh, build brands then as a result? I'm sorry, but it has to be about the creativity. Unilever was talking today that they have data that shows creativity explains 80%, channels explain 20%. But it seems to me that the percentage of time we have spent conversing and talking about these things are inverted. This is part of our database on digital ROI. So we, we've done around 14,000 campaigns, so this is not a small, of digital testing in terms of how brands actually perform after the advertising has happened. And we always, always ask about creative on our test. So we always ask, how do you feel about the creative? So what we did is we look at our database and we segmented it into two. Those campaigns that the let's say the score on the creative was high versus was low. And the campaigns that actually have a low creative perception from the consumer have a negative impact on brand. So let alone about what is the impact in terms of driving the lift, there can be a negative impact on brand by having a bad creative online. I'm gonna skip this as well because I'm just conscious I've got three minutes. Um, and it's not just about creativity, it's about creativity in a cross-media environment. This is work from the IRF, the, Association, um, the, the Advertising Research Foundation, and they did an amazing piece of work, over 5,000 brands um, across 41 countries, and they actually look at 1,000 campaigns, and they concluded that campaigns that only have one media as a touch point, they have a benchmark of 100 in terms of ROI. Campaigns that use two media is 19% greater efficiency. Campaigns that use five, 35. And if you think about this for a second, consumers are not digital or non-digital. Consumers are consumers. And what this means is if I use more touch points to actually deliver my message, I have a much better chance to give a holistic perspective of my brand. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense. The risk of that, and Keith With was mentioned today a couple of times, is that that can also lead to brand fragmentation. Even more so if we say that creativity needs to be done differently into every environment, et cetera, et cetera. Again, what we then did with the Advertising Research Foundation is we, we partnered them and we look at the creatives in that multimedia environment. So what you see on the left are campaigns that have used more than one touch point, but the actual advertising idea was not integrated across the different touch points. So pretty much every touch point was saying something different versus campaigns where there was an integration. And the ROI, this is actually real sales ROI, was 48% higher for campaigns that use the same creative idea across all the different touch points. And by same, I mean, is visually easy to see that is the same campaign. Obviously then if you tailor that creativity to the actual screen, it's not the same a video on YouTube than a video on TV, then you can reach up to 67% better, better ROI. Yeah. So to me the question again, is, do we have a strong advertising ideas? It feels that whoever says advertising ideas these day and age sounds like you are talking of the 90s and the, the mad men. And, but do we actually have a strong advertising ideas that can cut across a, a multi-platform reality? So I'll finish off with just four points with comes to measurement. Um, the first one is, to be honest, start with what is simple to measure, be disciplined. I was in a workshop the other day in Malaysia with a client, and they, we had the digital agency, the media agency, the advertising agency, the client, and us, 
And the whole workshop was about the launch of a campaign. And our role there was how were we going to measure it? It was extremely complex digital campaign. And when the brand owner stands up and starts talking about this and says, well, the whole strategy lies in this video that we've created with the hope that it's going to become viral. And I simply ask, and um, have you tested this video? I mean, do we know if this video has really the potential to become viral? And there were all blank faces in the room. Now, then we spent a whole day how we're going to be able to measure within Facebook, within YouTube, within a lot of complex environments. And nobody had talked about or thought about the most simple things. So my advice is really I start with and be disciplined with things like, is my creative idea strong enough? Do I have an execution that is going to cut through the clutter? Remember that 80-20 that we were talking about. The second thing is measure what matters, not what you can. Um, and, and we do know that brand matters. Um, so the first thing you can measure is you can measure whether your brand strategy is built on solid perspective of sales. You can know whether you have a brand strategy that is going to deliver those sales. Validate your audience. I think that is a critical part. So that matters, and that you can do relatively easy. Know who you've reached to with, with your campaigns. I will say there is also with digital this, this perception that measurement needs to be perfect, because digital can deliver perfect measurement. Um, and as a result, we tend to measure a lot of silos. So we have perfect measurement for this publisher. We have perfect measurement for that publisher. But we have no clue of what's happening across. And what I've shown you before is that synergies are more important than touch points on their own. So compromise, I will compromise with the measurement and use more probabilistic measures, but ensure that you are assessing your full, your full spend. And the last one is really survey data sounds like a dirty word. Um, but let me tell you, survey data, there are things that consumers are never going to let you know. Um, and there are ways in which survey data can help to enrich data that you're using on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. And with that, unless there are questions, BJ, I'm done. Thank you.